Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Hello everyone, I am Amara Chiarakwe with Our Town Podcast for KSMQ Public Television. This podcast shares about events, businesses, organizations, and other happenings across Rochester. So today we have Bud Whitehorn here to discuss the Black Lives Matter movement. So welcome Bud, how are you today? I'm doing just fine. The first question we're gonna start off with, what does the phrase not the movement, but the phrase Black Lives Matter. What does that mean? I think, yeah, it's important to know that uh, Black Lives Matter is, is a statement and uh, more than a movement. It's just a statement that, um, to, to speak out that um, Black Lives has been ignored for a lot of years um, here in America and, and reminding people that Black Lives Matters as well as other li- matters. Um, as, I'm sorry, as other lives matter. Um, it's just remind. It's just a reminder that Black Lives Matter too, and it's speaking against the oppression and the systemic racism that's been um, that's oppressed Black lives for um, for decades and centuries. And um, so the Black Lives Matter movement. So in a way, this is this is a movement that also speaks on the Black Lives Matter at a larger scale. So what does the movement mean to you? Um, I I guess I don't like to consider it as a movement because um, it's more of a statement, a reminder, and um, the movement is um, uniting um, the people to have a um, a consolidated voice to um, to get to to fight against this system. Right, and you mentioned fight against the system. So there are some people who don't believe that Black lives are oppressed. How do we help them understand? Um, we help them understand by by, by challenging them to um, to look at the history, to understand that um, how the laws were formed, how, how the laws, law and policies were created, the law and policies of this country were created, um, and how law enforcement was created. Um, to police slaves and um, how systemically um, things are not equal. There's no real diversity and inclusion in these communities. Um, we are not included equally and um, on, um, rep- we, we're not included equally in the workforce um, and leadership in um, different organizations, education. We don't have the same opportunity given to our um, to our counterparts. Sorry. Right, and in Rochester, you do serve as a liaison between the Black community and the Rochester Police Department. Mm-hmm. How has it been so far? Can you share the lessons that you've learned? Um, so far, you know, um, with a little, just a little history of uh, the relationship between. Black community and law enforcement. Uh, we know, we all know, the law enforcement was uh, started. The history of law enforcement was started. Um, um, Police and slaves, runaway slaves, and uh, the tension has grown. You know, since slavery ended. Uh, we have the Jim Crow's. We have a lot of things um, that has created this distrust and this fear between a relationship with law enforcement and the black community, ages and um, historically just just, um, distrust and hate and uh, fear. So um, as a community liaison, I don't speak for all black people, but what I do is try to help black people. My primary goal is to help black people find their voice, create a voice, and activate that voice to be able to speak for themselves. And um, and so far, 
we've um, had a lot of sessions, listening sessions, where we have lived, uh, we've had real life lived experiences and stories that Rochester Police Department has been sitting in. And the Chief Franklin has been wonderful. Um, Captain Stillwell and some of the lieutenants has been uh, very hands on and listening to some of the stories of how law enforcement affected the lives and household of black individuals in the Rochester community. And through this relationship building that you guys are working on, how has both parties been receptive to it? Initially, was there some hesitancies before you guys found a good groove? How, how did uh, the process look like? Oh, uh, it's, it's been a lot of hesitancy, you know, because there's, there's distrust and there's misunderstanding. And what is misunderstanding, there's a lot of fear. People tend to fear what they don't understand and not just from black individuals, but also, also to some of the officers. And I think that's um, some of the reasons that, um, that, well, the primary goal, well, one of the primary goals is to, I guess, increase the level of positive interactions so that when someone calls 911 and officer arrives on the scene, that hopefully we can get to the point where that interaction is not that first interaction on a negative 911 call. So we increase the level of positive interactions. We want to uh, create more activities. I'm planning activities for the summer, um, events where we'll get the officers to engage more with the community, with the black community. Yeah, that sounds really good plans because if the officers already know the community, I mean, they have this friendship going on, then when they meet each other, like in those instances, it's not, you know, with, it's not met first with aggression. It can be met more with um, positive, right. Um, right. positive collaboration. Exactly. And, and it, it don't even have to be a friendship, just something, um, a relationship, some type of relationship that's, um, that is not engaged from a hostile situation. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's going to be people, it's going to be take, a, it's going to take some time yes. to, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot of layers of, uh, of pain, a lot of layers of, uh, you know, turmoil and distrust that we got to peel back and it's going to take a little time. So yes, we want to increase the level of positive interaction so we can decrease the, the, um, hopefully the, 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 the negative interactions. Right, and could you speak more about these events that you, you're planning? Well, we want to, um, we, we're still in the plan, planning stages, but we, we talked about some, maybe some uh, softball games with, with, with the police force in the community. We talked about, we have some, um, some events uh, where um, we'll be, or officers will be passing out some food and uh, ice cream um, to some of the, um, the, the, Comp, the apartment complexes with, um, you know, predominantly black residents. Um, we also, we, we spoke about having um, um, just targeted, targeting events, making sure that the right people, um, that, that the events hit, I'm sorry, is promoted in the right areas, yeah. if I will. Yeah, well, I, I like that. I definitely look forward to those events. And uh, so we, the, the phrase Black Lives Matter, it was coined by Alicia Garza following George Zimmerman's acquittal and the killing of Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, more lives have been lost at the hands of police officers and non-police officers. Some of these lives lost were Michael Brown, Taylor, um, Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor, Eric Garner, Ahmed Aubrey, Sandra Bland, and Tommy Rice. And, about 90 miles away, we also lost Philando Castile, Dante Wright, and George Floyd. Yes. So as a black man, how is how has your daily life been affected by these ongoing tragedies? I mean, honestly, it's it's been really traumatic. Anytime I listen to them, I I I I'm at the point where I'm um I don't want to turn the news on a lot, you know, because they talk about these things. And these things, I'm gonna just give you a little bit of background of myself. I come from the, the south side of Chicago and uh, I used to be, uh, before I changed my life, I was from the streets and I had been victimized from pro police brutality, um, 
racial racial um um what am I looking for um profiling been profiled so many different times um times I've been profiled so many different times um victim of poli police brutality um harassment and so when I see these things I see myself in those situations I saw myself on a on on the ground when David show I mean when Derek Chauvin was was choking um Derek and George Floyd with his knee. I saw myself on the ground when he had his knee on his neck. I saw myself there. So I'm living these traumatic events in my head. It makes me want to um, work harder, work harder. And we we have a long way to go. But you know, um, I feel the need to 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 do my part and to help to change the system because it's it's really. Um, affecting the lives of our, our black boys and our black men. I have six black boys, so I don't know, you know, I got to pray before I leave, before they leave the house that, that they don't, you know, I don't get a phone call mm -hmm. that, um, that they were, became victimized of, of a, a unarmed shooting. Mm -hmm. And as a black dad um, and as a father to, you know, six young boys, mm -hmm. I can understand that, you know, when you see them go out the house, you're so afraid and, but yet there comes this, how do you teach them how to navigate these realities while also protecting your innocence? Because they are young boys. It's a sad reality that we have to have that conversation, but I have, I, I do have that conversation. Um, and it's sad that we have to, I have to tell my boys to choose to live, to, um, you know, um, to how, not to um, speak up when the, the 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 situation is hostile, and to um, follow the instructions um, and no sudden movements. Uh, I've had these conversations numerous numerous amount of time, but then you got situations where um, Philando Castro did everything he's supposed to do and still was shot. So it's it's tough, you know, um, and it's a tough conversation. And it's, you know, a tough, um, you know, um, way to live. But I think it's a fight that I'm, I'm, I'm up to the task. I think uh, that it's going to take a lot. I mean, it starts with the, the laws and the policy, but then we want to start right here in Rochester at the ground level where the officers has the, the um, they have, they can choose how, they um police and for the most part here in rochester uh we have some good officers but you know we have good officers everywhere i have a son my oldest son is a chicago police officer so i know there's good cops out here okay. so we just need to just put the do the work we got a lot of work to do i also believe that this fight should not be ours alone to fight so how could the community at large how can they support us as allies well, first of all, we gotta we gotta make ourselves comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. Thank you guys for for talking about this. Now you know a lot of people need to hear, a lot of people need to force themselves to see that there is a problem with the system. There is racism inside of our system. You know, have that tough conversation with yourself, and then also with your children. Talk about it. Talk about what's going on. Talk about um, George Floyd with your children, and let them know what really happened. You know, um, don't cover up um, the truth and um, let them know the, what the real wrong look like. And also uh, when there's events here in the community, support it. You know, if you can't support it financially, um, support them by helping spread the word. Come, um, come volunteer. Um, different organizations out here um, that, that's doing so much positive work support these organizations um, and continue just to pray. For more information about this story and other Our Town features, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter at KSMQ hashtag Our Town or ksmq.org slash Our Town.
Adventure. This is Michael Wojak with your Our Town Rundown. It's been hot and then cold and then hot and then cold and then hot and then cold. And that means it's springtime in Rochester. Right after spring comes summer. Great time to be outdoors and swimming in our pools. We have two pools in Rochester and the City Council recently voted to allocate an extra $100,000 to keep the Silver Lake pool open one more year. One thing that you might not know is the two pools are only about a 10 minute bike ride or lime scooter apart. So you can actually go to one and follow city trails to the other one. It's a fun thing you can do with your family in the summer. We have a number of events coming up. Uh, Good Night Gracie, the last show of the season from Rochester Civics Theater is playing next weekend only. We Are Water exhibit at Rochester Art Center is going to be ending on May 9th. So if you haven't seen that, it'd be a good to weekend to get out there and see that. Grounded is a presentation being put on by Absolute Theater. That's going to be going on this weekend and next. I encourage you to get out and catch some local theater, and that is going to be at the castle. Uh, one of the institutions of spring here in Rochester, Art on the Avenue, which is a celebration of Slatterly Park, that is scheduled for May 15th. That is a fun event for the whole family, and I encourage you to get out there and support some local artists. Lastly, Canvas and Chardonnay are doing a number of um, uh, spring themed uh, painting classes. There's a spring inspired class on uh, Friday evening and then there's some additional flower painting classes coming up. You can check that out at their website. Don't forget it's Mother's Day weekend. Don't forget to give mom a call and uh, tell her how wonderful she is. There's also an, a link that we're going to provide you below that uh, will show you what's going on with a number of different downtown businesses, specials that they have going on for Mother's Day. And that's just a little bit of what's going on in Rochester. On the Black Lives Matter movement, there's also been a history where we've noticed that there's not always accountability on the police officers. So recently with Dart Chauvin, who was convicted of second degree murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter for killing George Floyd. Mm -hmm. What does this verdict mean to you, your family, and the Black community? Well, it was big. It was big. You know, um, it felt good that we finally got some type of justice. George Floyd, I heard someone say, George Floyd is the Emmett Till of today. You know, uh, Emmett Till never got his justice. His, his parents, his mother passed away, not seeing his, um, the justice for the people that murdered him. Um, and it, it, was, it was a win, you know, um, but we got a long way to go. Can you discuss how trauma influences behavior and how that could be addressed? Well, trauma have a direct effect on your behavior, in my opinion. Um, you know, um, it, it, it induces the fear that comes with um, the interactions. When um, George Floyd trial was going, uh, they played that video maybe a hundred times. And like I said before, you know, I when I saw, though, when I see that video, I see myself in that. So just imagine yourself, dying a hundred times back to back to back and uh you know and now you see the officer you know um you got anxiety you got you got tension you have the fear you have the the, the unknown you got the distrust you don't know so a lot of time that trauma will um will induce that negative behavior that flight you know that when you get into the fight um Fight, the fight, fight or freeze mode. A lot of times, it it um, it's hard to make the right choice in those in those uh, moments. And um, yeah, so in, in my opinion, Dante, he was um, he was reacting from directly from the trauma that um, that is real. That's very real here in our black community. I'm glad you point that out because sometimes when some people watch the videos, they think. Um, he should have complied, but it's it's also important that they understand that the person involved is coming from those the history um, from those historical traumatic experiences during those interactions. So, yeah, you you know you comply is not a guarantee to still live. So when you we have that in your mind, in the back of your mind, complying is not enough. Mm -hmm. What do you do? So it's easy for people to say, well, you, complying is always the best answer. But then when you're worried about living whether you comply or or not 
you're gonna just um you you really in survival mode. Earlier you mentioned in terms of um, building positive interactions between the police department and the black community. So, and also some certain reforms that needs to be in place. What sort of reforms are you hoping to see? I'm hoping to see more accountability with some of the officers that um, that um, abuse the power and abuse the, their, um, their job um, with obsessive force and brutality, um, not just um, shootings, but um, looking to see more, um, more um, diversity training and more community related activities surrounding the um, police force so that um, it helps with the relationships with the community. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And at times. Well, you know, and I guess another thing, and, you know, to not to say to defund the police, but more funding, putting more funds and um, programs and understanding that we need to see other people and leadership and um, officers that look like us. So we need to, um, recruiting practices need to be looked at, um, also the training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I understand that in this community, you wear many hats. I mean, you're the owner of the White Horn Reliable Shorter Service. You're the yes. deacon at Christ's Way for Gospel. Yes. Facilitator of the local organization, Hustlers Anonymous. Yes. And also the co-host of Barbershop Talk South Minnesota. Yes. I mean, that's a mouthful, you're, you're busy. <laughs> so I would like to know what have you learned from, about Rochester, from this interactions with the members and also the leaders in this community? Well, Rochester's, um has a lot of potential. It has a lot of people here, um, talented, gifted people, but we got a long way to go to become truly diverse, diverse. You know, we, we, we need to um, expand. We need to grow um, with the, the growth of our city. We need to, we need to, to, um, to really become diverse. We need to support a lot of minority organizations, but I think we've come a long way but we still have a lot, a long way to go. At times, in, in addition to people saying um, all lives matter in mm -hmm. response to Black Lives Matter, sometimes to describe the movement as racist, political, socialist, and violent. So how do you respond to people with this mindset? I mean, how can we explain it to them where we're coming from? Well, you explain it by saying, you know, um, when you say all lives matter, it's actually um, mocking the 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 whole reasoning why we say Black Lives Matter. We're saying Black Lives Matter because Black Lives Matter has been ignored. And understand that um, we're not saying that Black Lives is better than any other life. It's a simply reminder that Black Lives Matter too. So when you say all lives matter, you're speaking against the movement. How could the community learn more, you know, about our experiences so that they can have some sort of understanding? I say, um, I ask um, white counterparts to do research, to talk about, um, talk, have conversations with uh, other white individuals that don't understand or refuse to understand. Hold them accountable. Talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, people should also seek knowledge for themselves. You yes. know, instead of us carrying the burden of always, you know, educating the public. So, so thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. No problem. Well, thanks for tuning in to Our Town Podcast. I am Amara Chiarakwe, your moderator with KSMQ Public Television. You can also catch up with us on Facebook or Twitter at KSMQ hashtag Our Town.